Good. It's great. It's working. Fantastic. Okay. Well, a very good morning to everybody. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share in this moment of spiritual reflection and meditation. And I'd like to thank the hosts and the platform for giving me this opportunity to be with you this morning. I am hoping that it will be food for thought and will be a blessing to each and every one. And the, the question I'm asking this morning is, can Great Britain become great again? This is the question. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, well, it depends on what happens on Sunday night. Um, but I want to go deeper. And um, let me share with you a quotation. This comes from a chap by the name of Niall Ferguson, a Scottish historian. And he says in his book, Empire, for better or worse, fair and foul, the world we know today is in large measure a product of Britain's age of empire. The question is not whether British imperialism was without blemish. It was not. The question is whether there could have been a less bloody path to modernity. Perhaps, in theory, there could have been. But in practice, there's a lot in this um, quote by this historian who has obviously studied in detail the checkered past of Great Britain. But I don't really want to focus so much on the past, but to really look at today and where we're going, because it doesn't look as if Great Britain is getting greater and getting better as we look forward. But maybe we could ask ourselves the question to begin with. What made Britain great? What made great Britain great? Well, now Ferguson is going back and seeing the British Empire, you know, between mid 18th century and 19th century, and seeing our colonial past. And I can recognize that at that time, Historians tell us that Great Britain owned one-fifth of the world. 20% of the world was owned or controlled by Great Britain. That's, that's pretty great. But when we think about the colonial empire and how it, uh, how it accrued, its wealth. It, it does beg the question, well, what kind of great are we talking about when we think about can Great Britain become great again? And I'm thinking about the slave trade that fueled the industrial, revo industrial revolution, which placed Britain in a position to influence the whole world. But if you dig deep in this book, you'll discover that uh, in our checkered history, we have been involved in some brutal massacres of a humongous scale. And that we have also, in our past, been involved in instigating, controlling and running concentration camps. Hmm. And then of course we can think of, in later times, uh, the Iraq war. And if we look at today, we can see today that this country, great though it may have been in times past, put a quotation mark around greatness, we see that today, I'm not so sure if we're heading in the right direction. For example, when we think about the environment and pollution, when we think about the immigration and racial inequality and inequality in general, when we think about crime and law and order, drug and alcohol 
abuse, the, our aging population, our lack of trust in the government, it, it makes me wonder, can this nation become great again? And really, I, I'm asking the question this morning, if we are to transform ourselves from where we are now to where we want to be as a country, how would we do this? How does one change, transform, reconfigure a country? And I guess on a deeper level, on a spiritual level, I'm not even really talking about Great Britain, but rather I'm talking about me and you. For we are the citizens, the subjects of this great country. And make no mistake as to what I'm saying. This is a great country. That's the reason why we are living here. And I don't have any plans to leave, to go anywhere else. But as far as me and you are concerned, the people that make up this great country, how can we change? Let me ask you, my brother or my sister or friend, have you had a checkered past, a dark beginning or history in times past? Are you any different from all of us in general? And look at us today as individuals, and I'm focusing on the spiritual aspect. Are we where we need to be? How can we, much less a country, transform ourselves? Is there a way to do this under God? Is there a way to change spiritually? This is the question that I'm really asking this morning. And I'm wondering, maybe you could indicate by raising your hands on the app. Would this be a good topic to discuss briefly this morning? Give me some feedback by raising your hands on the app. Press the raise your hands button. Talking about a plan, a course of action, a place to start to change ourselves and in so doing to change a country. Does this sound like a good idea? And as I look at blank screens, no photos, no noise, no hands whatsoever. Can somebody, somebody give me an indication? Does this sound like an interesting topic worth spending a bit more time talking about? Maybe somebody could unmute their mic if they don't know how to raise their hands and tell me. Yes, Mark, I think this is a good thing to talk about today. I'm a school teacher. So I'm used to silence. Yes, it is. There are four hands up, actually. All right. Okay. Thank you, my sister. I can't see anything. But if you, if you think this is a good idea, then I'm going to press ahead and, and talk a bit more on this. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and let's invite God's presence into our meeting once again. Dear Father, I know you hear us. I know that you can see us. I know you understand us. We are asking, dear Father, that you will come into our presence. We're asking you to forgive us of our sins. And we are asking that you will make this brief moment of meditation fruitful and a blessing to each and every one of us who are here. We pray in the name of the Son. Amen. You don't know this, but I'm a school teacher. And uh, I've been teaching for quite some time now in uh, what you might call deprived schools. Schools that are struggling. And... Um, when you go into schools like this, um, there's all sorts of things that you might see um, in a school. And 
as you walk into the school that I'm in right now, if you walk into the playground, it will be a hustle and bustle of noise, kids playing. And when the school bell rings, they'll all charge into the school building. Teachers are hoping that when they get to their class, when they come to my class, I can somehow stem the flow of kids, slow them down, allow them to trickle into my class, and that I might then take over and be an influencer, be a teacher, and to control these kids and somehow engage and inspire them to achieve greatness. I know you're thinking, man, on what age are these kids? Well, I'm talking about um, 11 to 16. Teenagers, young people. And um, I've wondered, how does one transform a school? How does one change uh, the chaos that might appear to be the case into order? And not just order, but so that the young people can go on to achieve greatness. How do you do it? I've thought about it and said to myself, well, if there was a specific way to do this, why doesn't the government share the plans, give us the means, and let every school be achieving like they do in Norway? No such thing here in this country. And so schools like the one that I'm attending at the moment struggle along, seeking transformation, seeking change, but not knowing how. Well, I was speaking not too long ago with a leader, school leader, and myself and this um, person are working together to transform this school and we were talking in the playground and we were seeing the rabble of a line of kids that we were waiting to say run along into the school it's your turn and she turned to me and she said mark let me tell you something she said you see this line it's not a line it needs to change these kids need to be taught how to stand in a line i said don't you think they know this already. She says, no, obviously not. They need to be shown. I said, what were you thinking? She says, they need, they need to be shown that they need to stand in a single file, shoulders square, in silence. In my mind, I thought, silence? What, in the playground? She said, yes. And she says, the teacher who is about to teach them the next lesson, they need to come down in the playground before school starts and be standing ready to take the charge. I thought to myself, really? And I said to her, well, what would you say if star staff thought that their business needs to be in the classroom and they need to prepare for the class and get things ready? Just let the kids run in and then they will deal with them at this classroom door. She said, no, no, no. She said, Mark, if we are going to transform this school, it can't be done by just telling the teachers to teach better. I said, no. She says, oh, no, 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 no. She says, the transformation can't be in the classroom. I said, well, what, what are you thinking? She said, the transformation, the change must start from the moment they come into the school gate. I said, my goodness. She said, you see them coming into the playground and lining up. We need to demonstrate to them how that's done. Show them how. And the transformation takes place in the line. I said, tell me more. She said, what needs to change, Mark, is not the teaching and learning, although that could be improved. 
She said it's not the work of the leaders and just getting better leaders in to do the same thing, although that would be desirable. She says, first and foremost, there must be a change in the school culture. I, I mean, I was engaging in dialogue here, so I said, mm. she said, what needs to change here, first and foremost, is the culture of the school. And she went on to say, and I know how. And myself and this lady are working together to transform the culture of the school. And we are going to be preparing to tell teachers that what you need to do doesn't start in the classroom, but starts when they walk in to the school gates. Friends, brothers and sisters, let me ask you this question. Do you think that churches need to transform in this way? You know, when I first met this lady who, who we're working together with, she, uh, she reminded me of a Bible verse, Jeremiah chapter, 13 verse 23, I hope you can, you can see on the screen. Um, she reminded me of this verse, which says, can the Ethiopian change his skin, the color of his skin, or the leopard, his spots? Then also you can do good, can you change, who do good, who are accustomed to do evil, is a thought that I had. I mean, you can change the culture of a school, but can you change the culture of a church? Excuse me. What do you think? What do you think that's needed? Well, if you study the scripture, and if you come away from looking at the scripture verse by verse, and start to connect ideas book by book, and then start to zoom out and look at the ideas across testaments. You might see the beginnings of a plan that God had originally intended. Take a look at this picture. This is a church, typical church. I must confess it doesn't look like the kind of church I've been going to, but it's a typical church, a large church. How would you transform a church, much less a country? How would you transform a church? Could it be that we should follow the similar steps that this lady was suggesting by transforming the culture of that church? Looking at the scriptures, God has suggested how we might do that change in a church, in a community, which is, which is really what I'm saying. Take a look at this image. Recognize this image. This is God's plans as he laid them out to Israel, who had been enslaved for 400 years and had just come out and now needed to become great again and needed to transform and be changed what did god do for such a group of people if you look at this picture can you see he is changing the culture the lifestyle the actions every day of what god's people were doing and here looks like doesn't this look like serious order, serious changes from the gate, from, from the very get-go? He, he is in this picture, if you don't recognize what it's saying, in the middle is the sanctuary, is the temple. And that is the focal point in the middle of the camp. This is the camp of Israel. 
And around the camp, we have all of the 12 tribes, not arranged haphazardly, but they are in a specific order. You have three on each side or face of the camp, the north, the south, the east of the west and the west. Each tribe has their standard on display and you have the leaders and uh, you have the headquarters of where each tribe are and you have if you look at the outside of the picture there, you have all of the people in their tents, arranged in perfect order. Let me ask you the question, brothers and sisters and friends. How comes we think that we can bounce into church any old how, any way we want? Have you, have you ever thought to yourself, why do I have to do it this way? Why can't I do it my way? They've been doing things like that in schools for a long time. And all it's produced is mediocrity at best and chaos at the worst. In God's eyes, to change a church you have to change individuals. And it makes me think, sorry, you have, to, you have to change the culture, the culture of that church. And it makes me think of this verse, uh, Numbers 2. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but for any of you here, take a look at Numbers chapter 2, because Numbers chapter 2, from the first verse all the way down, it outlines this diagram that I've just shown you. It tells you what God was expecting the people to do from the get-go. And it sounds like, I don't know what you're thinking, but it sounds like he made them line up in a certain way. And as I think ahead, I'm thinking, well, how would you transform the family, the subjects and the citizens of this fine country? Would it be something similar? Do you think, friend, that the families that reside in this great country, if they were to be more ordered, more disciplined, more principled, together, moving in harmony, every family together, moving in harmony, the whole country moving together, towards its goals do you think that would make a difference where would we go for the blueprint for this transformation and do you think like the school like the church israel that with the family what's needed is a change in the culture of families I know politicians are more concerned about policy at a higher level. We need to deal with the issues of immigration and crime and law and order. But wouldn't this be akin to a school changing things at the leadership level, top down, and not thinking from the very beginning how to transform the culture, the thinking, the small actions of the pupils. And in a church setting or in a community setting, individuals, don't you think the family would need this? And where would we get this culture from? Well, it seems to me that there was no need to make up this idea of changing the culture of an organization, a community. It may have appeared that this lady had a handle on what needed to be done, but God, in his wisdom, in the Bible, had already made this transformation millennia ago as a model for a country, a group of people, a community, families, individuals to transform themselves 
and change themselves so that they could become great again, spiritually speaking. I mean, this reminds me of this verse when I think about families changing. Genesis 18, verse 18 and 19 says, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. God had picked someone who was going to start the transformation and to build up Israel again or God's people again. He started with one person who was going to have this plan. And why did he do this? It says here in verse 19, for I have chosen him haphazardly, arbitrarily, no, it continues, that he may command his children, order his children, sort out his kids from when they come in the gate and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him to make him great. Pause and think about what I'm trying to say, my friends. What I'm really trying to say is what the school needed was a change in the culture. And it needed someone who was going to do that, administer that, and to make the changes. And the changes are not at the top, but the changes start with the little things, right as soon as kids come into the school playground. But this would apply to the church, it seems. God needs that same order. And that plan is not coming from the lady in the playground, it's coming from God himself. And this plan to transform institutions and communities is a plan that comes from God himself. But it, it doesn't stop here. When you think about our great country and all of the issues that we have in our country, we could think of the, the most recent one, which is COVID-19 and how to deal with the pandemic so that all of its people are safe. Do you think that maybe our politicians are not thinking like the school lady was in the school playground. Maybe they're thinking too lofty and too high, but really what's required is a change in the culture of this country. If we go back centuries, we find that this country was a strong Christian nation and that culturally the people of this good country were very spiritually minded, but things have changed and we are here now where we are. I think that if this country was to consider becoming great again, it would have to start by changing the culture of the country. Makes me think of this verse in Daniel chapter 3, 28 and 29. Have you ever come across this? Uh, the, the three friends of Daniel have just refused to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar, who asked them to worship an idol. You know, in this country of ours, in schools, uh, we are teaching everyone that there is no such thing as truth. Yeah, this is being taught throughout every subject in the national curriculum. There is no such thing as truth. To which I would ask anybody who asked me that question, would you say that's a true statement? And because they are teaching this, it is changing the culture and the lifestyle of what was a great country to some degree in the past. We are becoming more secular. We don't believe in any moral values. You can do 
as you please and we must be tolerant of your truth and my truth let me have my truth this country teaches and you can have your truth i will respect your truth as long as you respect my truth this is pluralism relativism this is our postmodern secular society which has changed our culture and so we are seeing as we read the newspaper the consequences of such an action being taught to all children in school universities it's transformed the culture of this country We're going back to this verse these three boys they refused to bow down to this image an edict from the country's leader they had already transformed their own culture amongst their own families amongst themselves as individuals and they made a stand and we're picking the end of that story up in verse 28 and it says nebuchadnezzar answered and said blessed be the god of shadrach meshach and abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants from the fire who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own interesting these three boys had already changed their personal culture to the point where the king says they had yielded up their bodies because they had changed even their diets rather than to serve and worship him and what was the result of this verse 29 says nebuchadnezzar speaking therefore i make a decree this is the king of a country talking to all of its citizens and subjects any people nation or language that speaks against the god of shadrach meshach and abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way let me ask you the question my friends can a country become great again because individuals families communities churches transform the culture of their lives can that transform a country looks like in this example here that's exactly what happened it didn't take a massive media machine it took three people and maybe some more who were resolute about changing their personal culture within their families within their social groupings and in this case god is saying it only takes a few to transform a country can great britain become great again well according to this verse it can but steady on steady on it's not going to be easy it takes changes from people like you people like me you know when, when, when you look at this thing from a whole if we want this country to change and to start achieving and to start accomplishing in the right way and i'm going to tag on there in a spiritual sense then this country must change its culture and i'm suggesting this morning that that change doesn't start with the leaders but it starts with communities it starts with churches groups of people but the changes within those communities happens in your home as a family and ultimately one person you or i must make this change we don't have to worry about the plan 
what, what changes need to be made? Where do I go for this? We are suggesting, I'm suggesting that what well, the Bible is the place to go for this. And as you can see from what I showed you earlier, God has the plan. God has the blueprint. We only have to see it and abide by it. You know, when I think about ancient Israel, when they're enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years, any group of people that have been enslaved for 400 years, they, they personally would have habits and ways of thinking that could only be described as confused. And when we look at ancient Israel, we see that God did the same thing that I'm suggesting today. When those people came out of Egypt and came to Mount Sinai, and God said to ancient Israel, okay, I'm going to take over, but I'm going to make you great. You are going to be an example of a nation to the whole world, but it's going to have to start with changing your culture, your ideas on how to live, how to eat, how to dress, how to operate, your goals, your desires, your life destinations, your partners, everything must change from the very beginning and must be ordered. This is what's needed to transform a country such as Great Britain. So let me just summarize some actions that we might need to do as individuals. Can I recommend first and foremost, my friend, my brother, sister, we must first of all become a truth seeker. That's right, a truth seeker. We must be willing to accept that there is such a thing as truth and that we want it. This means being a truth seeker, that we must be willing to be open, be willing to change, and that we must follow the evidence wherever that leads. If it's true, it's going to lead us to greatness. What would have happened if I had spoken to that school leader and said, well, that's absolute rubbish. You don't understand this school. You don't understand this community. We know. And can you imagine me closing that conversation with that school leader just like that? The school, by the way, that we were talking about, it's on its way to becoming outstanding because as a school, we were willing to follow the evidence, to seek better ways, to seek the truth. And I think this is the first thing that we need to consider if we want to transform this country, but from an individual perspective. The second thing is, if you're a truth seeker, recognize that God himself is truth. The Bible says this. Jesus said it. He said that he was the truth. And so becoming a truth seeker means that we should be open to the God who says he is the truth. The third point is we need to seek his plan for transformation. There are many illustrations in the Bible where when man tries to make that change, when man tries to, tries to dream up the way to do things, it doesn't really help. And this is where we are as a country. This is what our leaders are doing. They are drinking at their meetings, having big lunches, staying up late at night, and they are making these decisions. I was reading in the research for that book, Empire, that uh, one of our Ill uh, illustrious leaders who was charged with dividing India into India and Pakistan, he made, when he was charged with that massive decision to, to do something, he split the country into two over lunch. 
over lunch. And when he split that country into two, it spawned the massacre of millions of people along religious lines by splitting that country into two. You know, we really need to seek God's plans. And if we are going to seek God's plans, my fourth point, so my first point in summary, in summary is to become a truth seeker. The second point was recognize that God is the truth. The third point was, and so seek his plans. My fourth point is, if you're going to understand God's plans, don't go to the book of Revelation. Go back to Genesis. Go back to the beginning. Going back to the beginning as a truth seeker is the way to understand the truth. Too many people want to understand the prophecies. I want to know what's happening in the end. I want to know what's happening in Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 14, chapter 17, chapter 18. But never having read Revelation chapter 1. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll discover that almost every chapter, every chapter starts with the word and, meaning that you had to look at the chapter before. You had to start at chapter one. And likewise, if we are seeking God's plans and we're going to look at the beginning, look at it from the beginning to understand it properly, you have to go back to the beginning. So there's no need to be tracking back to understand. You move forward with understanding. My other point was, when you go back to the beginning, let us start living as if that truth, when we read it, is real. This is what Jordan Peterson says. When asked the question, do you believe in Jesus Christ? He says, I don't know, but I live as if he is real. This is someone who you may call an agnostic. But if we are truth seekers, when you discover that truth in those plans at the beginning, we must start living that truth as if that truth is real. And it is. And finally, despite what you see around you, this country needs me and you to transform and change. It has to happen on the level of myself, yourself, your families. This is how the change is going to happen. So in conclusion, my brothers and sisters, what do you think? Can this great country become great again? Well, I think, I think it can. It might help if things go well on Sunday evening, but from what we've been discussing this morning, friends, spiritually speaking, there needs to be a change from me and you. How about that? What do you think about that? May God bless you as you reflect and meditate on the thoughts that we've shared this morning. Thank you.